All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome. And thank you so much for joining us tonight for our parent speaker series event. My name is Chrissy Jumbowski, and I'm the prevention program coordinator with um, the Communities That Care, or CTC, of Greater Downingtown. Um, we're excited that you were able to join us, and we actually have a very large group, almost 200 people that registered for this event, so um, a lot to get to. But really quick, I just wanted to go over the fact that our setup tonight is in a Zoom webinar. So you'll see at the bottom of your screen, you should see that there is a question and answer button that you can use. So as we're going through our presentation tonight, please feel free to use that button to ask questions. And we'll be going through and trying to pull out common questions to ask, holding until the end where we have time allotted for question and answers. So um, we're very excited to be able to offer these parent learning opportunities um, during this time in partnership and collaboration with Downingtown Area School District. So thanks again for being here and um, to all of our panelists and our speaker. And I'm gonna pass it over to Sarah Brooks from Downingtown Area School District. Hi hey everyone, my name is Sarah Brooks. I work with Student Assistance Services in Downingtown Area School District, as well as our Wellness Committee. I work most closely with our 10 prevention specialists throughout the district who actually work with students K through 12. Um, and I think Christy is actually gonna put in the chat box for you just contact information for our prevention specialists. Um, we do a lot of work with students individually in buildings, but then we also work with families oftentimes trying to get connected with local community mental health and drug and alcohol resources. So if you need more information at any point in time in regards to the work that the prevention specialists do, or if they might be of assistance to you or your student, you're certainly welcome to email or call them. You can also email or call me as well. Uh, email address is sbrooks at dasd.org. As Chrissy referenced, we actually had Dr. Winterstein here last year in January to talk about the really important topic of mental health and suicide prevention. And we were fortunate to have him back again this year, even though I know some of the circumstances have changed. So I just wanna say thank you again for being with us. We really do appreciate it. I know it is not an easy topic to engage in, but hopefully the information is, is helpful to you. Dr. Sinelli. Hey, thanks, Sarah. Hi, I'm Beth Ann Sinelli, Executive Director of Communities That Care. And I also work with the school district as the uh, wellness consultant. So also just uh, welcoming everyone this evening, um, just real briefly, Communities That Care is a collective of prevention partners in Downingtown. And our focus is substance abuse prevention and promoting positive mental health. Uh, so we work with the district, but we also provide programs and resources for youth. And of course, uh, parent engagement and working with families is a primary focus of communities that care. Um, just to mention that the program this evening, um, the focus of the program this evening comes not only out of parent concerns, but also out of our Pennsylvania Youth Survey data. So when we look at the PACE data from 2019 and look at information um, that our students shared with us in grades 6, 8, 10, 12, uh, there are questions that look at mental health issues, um, depression, of course, suicide prevention. So we wanna make sure that our parent programs are responsive to what the youth are saying, as well as parent concerns and the needs of the school district and the community. So that's why we're very excited to bring you um, this timely program this evening. And Chrissy will um, be sharing resources with you. And we also, if you uh, would like more resources, Community That Cares website has um, worksheets and handouts and programs and resources for parents. So you can access that from our website and also any of our social media platforms like our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So that's a little shout out to some community prevention programs and we are tied to other providers in the county that also can help you and support um, any concerns or questions you have in mental health. So I get to introduce our speaker this evening, which is very exciting. Um, Dr. Uh, Matt Winterstein, as we mentioned, was here with us last year as Associate Professor and Director in the Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia. And so I'm gonna turn this over to uh, Dr. Winterstein who can share as a program content with us this evening. Thanks, Matt. Great, thank you guys. Um, and welcome everybody. It's, it's always a pleasure to ha have the opportunity to sit down with families uh, within our school districts across Pennsylvania and have you know, really frank discussions about depression, about suicide risk, and you know, how as a parent can we be more attuned to these kinds of issues within our youth, whether it be our own children or, or perhaps even their friends, and you know, how can we be responsive to that in a meaningful way? Um, obviously the school district 
who can play an important role in terms of supporting your children throughout this process. Um, and so I encourage you obviously to reach out to, to that team as well, as well as all the other resources I think are gonna be shared with you here this, this evening through the others. Um, as, as everyone has sort of pointed out, you know, I gave this talk, I think it was last year in, uh, what was it, Lionville Middle School maybe, um, and uh, really well attended on that particular day. I appreciate everyone who came out that night. This is going to be quite honestly, almost identical to what we talked about then. Um, even the data around suicide hasn't changed a whole lot in the past year. There, we do have the 2019 data that literally just came out like a matter of a couple of days ago. Um, so I'll talk about that when we get there. Um, oftentimes I leave, I don't know, about 20% at the end of something unique and interesting that's going on in the world of suicide prevention. And uh, when, when the women here tonight shared with me that there was gonna be you know, 100, 150 people maybe on this particular webinar, I said, all right, I'm not gonna have that on there because I'd like to leave some more time at the end. We can have, you know, engage in some more Q and A, which I know is, um, you know, difficult sometimes when you have these webinar um, uh, type of formats where it's like people are typing questions and do we get through everything? And so I wanna make sure there's plenty of time to do that, but you know, obviously we have some time at the end, there's other things we could discuss as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and kind of get us rolling. All right, um, so why don't we power ahead a little bit. Um, the, the goal of what I have to discuss tonight, again, we're looking at depression first. I think there's a difference between what is depression versus what is sadness. And so we'll talk a little bit about what is depression, uh, which hopefully uh, will help us kind of separate those kinds of things. And again, if you have questions throughout this presentation, please go to the Q&A at the bottom, type in your question. Uh, and Chrissy's going to be moderating those and we'll be kind of sharing the questions with me when we get done. We're going to transition from depression to thinking about myths uh, as it relates to youth suicide. I'll give you a little bit of data on it. I think it's important to kind of understand it in context a little bit. I don't want to give you tons of data because nobody came for all of that. Uh, we will talk about warning signs for youth suicide. So how do you know when you should be concerned about somebody? And then finally, we're gonna end with how to respond. And so, you know, as a parent, how can we kind of manage these, um, you know, manage our response to, to, again, not necessarily our own children, but perhaps our own children and maybe their friends or other kids that we interact with as well. Um, those are learning objectives. They're important, more from a CEU perspective, which doesn't affect this talk. So I'm gonna kind of skip through it. It's very similar to what we just talked about. So let's talk a little bit about depression. We'll open with this, okay? So again, What's the difference between somebody who sort of meets the definition for like depression or a major depressive disorder versus someone who's sad? Um, what we know, and I'm gonna put this in the context of COVID, it's the, it's the elephant in the room that we can't avoid, right? You know, there is certainly has been an increase in both depression and anxiety when it comes to this global pandemic that we've all been managing in some context. Um, there have been plenty of individuals who have presented to behavioral health providers far more than usual. Um, and the most common things that people have come in for over the past 10 months has been depression and anxiety. Um, you know, but what's the difference between sadness and everything that we're dealing with stinks? Like, it's funny because it's sort of like at the beginning of this, people would say, oh, well, the introverts like really like this. I have to be honest with you. I don't know that there's anybody right now who would say, I love all of this. You know, there's pieces of it that we're learning. There's actually really good things in terms of service delivery that have come out of this pandemic. Um, telehealth being one of those kinds of things that, that we see such a great benefit from. But the point is that everybody's managing this in different ways. There is a difference between sadness and frustration and, and inability to tolerate some of this versus depression. So I'm gonna go through sort of our clinical symptoms of, of a depressive disorder to kind of put it in context for us. So the first is really this idea of depressed mood um, or irritability for most of the day, nearly every single day. Um, how that gets reported is, you know, just sort of feeling sad, empty. This is sort of the, the person who wakes up and just feels like, ugh, it's, you know, here we go again. Um, it can be observations made by other people that they just don't look the same as they did before, that they look like they're kind of down and out of it. But it's really this sense that people would describe and younger kids sort of, they, they don't necessarily have the words to describe it as sadness sometimes, um, but they may look more irritable or more agitated than before. And that might be a way that this sort of shows up in the younger kids. 
The second thing that we see when it comes to depression as a diagnosis is what we call anhedonia. And this is this concept of a decreased interest or pleasure in most activities. And so this is, if you think about the things that, that you know, your kids have been dealing with and what they've been going on in their lives, you know, and participating in sports, for example, and every school district's trying to figure out what to do about those kinds of things, you know, but with the availability of school sports, for example, or other sports, for perhaps if you've got a child who's been heavily involved in those things, but for whatever reason seems disinterested, not, you know, they did really well. It wasn't that they're disinterested because they didn't play a whole lot the previous years, or they just feel like they're outgrowing it or something like that, but rather they just, they were really involved before, but now have stepped away. That's something that we want to pay attention to and think about a little bit. So it's a, it's a decreased interest or pleasure in the things that we usually enjoyed doing in the past. So to technically to meet definition of a major depressive episode, um, you have to have one of these two things. And then we got several others to add on to it that you have to have some other, and many of these are sort of you know, physiological symptoms as opposed to sort of mental states in the way we think or you know, cognitively or emotively think about things. And so you know, one has to do a significant weight change or a change in appetite. And so we see either people eating a lot more or eating a lot less than they may have before. They may lose their appetite and not feel like eating at all, or they might be hungry all the time. Um, it is different for different people, um, but the point is one of the physiological symptoms we're looking for is a change, either weight gain, weight loss, or a change in appetite. Next one has to do with sleep. Uh, individuals who are sort of in this clinical depression either will sleep a whole lot or they may not sleep much at all. And it isn't that they aren't tired. There's a difference between depression and what we call mania. Mania is sort of the, almost the polar opposite of it. Um, and mania, individuals don't sleep, but they're not even tired versus individuals who are depressed and who can't fall asleep will readily tell you they're exhausted. They just simply um, can't move forward. They're so tired, but yet they just can't fall asleep oftentimes because things are going through their mind, they're really thinking about quite a bit, um, and that's getting in the way of their ability to kind of settle down and just sort of you know, create that safe space to just kind of let in and, and go to sleep. More often though, we typically see people sleeping a lot more. So either way, it's, it's a change in sleep. The other has to do with the change in physical activity. And so sometimes you see sort of this agitative kind of thing where people are constantly fidgeting around and they just can't sit still. Um, and it isn't like a, like a hyperactivity kind of agitation. It's more of a, it, it's almost like a, what do I say? Like wringing of the hands and like just sort of this can't sit still kind of peace. Um, or there is this slowness. There's this, um, kind of sluggishness that goes along with it. And so you see kind of, you know, one of those two directions. You can have a fatigue or a loss of energy. So this is different than just being tired. This is the person just is out. There's almost like you're out of gas, right? There's just nothing in the tank anymore. So it's not just tired, it's, it's out. Um, sense of guilt or worthlessness. And so when people, this is, you know, back away from the physiological stuff, but people get into these patterns sometimes where they feel like, they don't matter, that they are worthless, that their contribution is unimportant, um, and that they lack meaning in some particular way. And so there's that kind of slant to it. The other kind of slant to it is this um, excessive or inappropriate guilt about things. Now, all of us from time to time may feel some level of guilt about things that occur. It's one thing to feel guilty about something that's happened to which we believe we probably had some effect on. It's another thing to feel guilty about something that's happened that we probably either didn't have any impact on, or even if we did, we feel guilty for extensive periods of time, way beyond what one would expect. Those things are more suggestive of depression as opposed to um, the person who, yeah, I feel kind of bad about what happened and uh, you know, feel guilty about it, but um, are able to kind of move past that. The next one has to do with concentration. Of course, concentration is associated with lots of different clinical uh, sequelae. So it could be depression. We see concentration problems with anxiety. When people get really anxious, they can't focus very well sometimes. You see it with 
Um, ADHD, for example, you know, where kids simply can't focus long enough and pay attention long enough to really sort of digest what's being shared with them. We also see concentration problems with depression because they struggle sometimes with being able to hold the information, to stay att attuned to it and focused on it. Either the mental energy is just zapped and you can't stay focused in that, or their mind is constantly wandering to whatever the life circumstance, whatever it might be that they're trying to solve, and therefore the concentration lapses in that particular way. And then the last symptom that's associated with a major depressive disorder is suicidal thoughts. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have a plan. It doesn't mean that you have to engage in suicidal behaviors. And it certainly doesn't mean that everybody who's depressed has to have yes, suicidal have. thoughts. Siri apparently likes that word. It's going to be a long night. Um, anyway, the, um, the thing that we need to think about, though, is that um, to meet diagnosis, you have to have one of the first two, and you have to have five or more total, okay? So you have to have either one or two, you could have both, and then you have to have at least four, if not five, of two or three through nine. So you could actually have all these physiological symptoms, three, four, five, and six, and a sense of depressed mood and qualify for depression. Or you could actually have depressed mood, decrease in interest in anything, no physiological symptoms whatsoever, not having thoughts of suicide. You may not have any excessive guilt or a sense of worthlessness, but still have concentration problems. And you don't meet criteria for depression, even though you would say, I'm depressed. So all of these things into context sort of help us separate what's the difference between being sad and what's the difference between being depressed. And then there's these other things that go along with it, which is it can't just be something that you wake up one day and that day you then have depression. This lasts for a period of at least two weeks. It can often last much longer than two weeks. Um, and oftentimes it will go away. And depending on how we've addressed it, it may come back later on. It has to be a difference from how the person normally is. So there's another um, diagnostic group that used to be called dysthymia. It's called a persistent depressive disorder now. It's this sense of dysthymia is sort of this idea of, of feeling down or depressed more days than not. You don't necessarily meet all the criteria you see in front of you, but yet more days than not, you're sad. You simply can't get moving. Um, it, it, you just feel kind of in the funk. That's different. So this, this is two weeks of completely in a funk with the stuff that you're seeing on there. And the last thing that is on there is impairment. And that really is, is the thing that, a big thing that speaks to the issue between sadness and depression as well, which is it has to somehow impede your ability to do something that you need to be doing. Now for kids, that can be lots of different things. They may, you know, if we go back to the sports and activities kind of thing, they may not be able to participate in those things because they simply can't get themselves there or mentally, physically, whatever it might be. Um, it could be uh, work, they have a job and they're really struggling at work because they can't concentrate. The depression has really affected that. Uh, it could be schoolwork, you know, that, that their job is to go to school and to do their homework. And if they can't get their homework done because of this depression, then we would argue that there's an impairment there too. So this is how we think about depression. And this is, you know, really the context around that. Um, I'm going to shift gears. We're going to move into thinking about suicide now and talking about um, myths related to youth suicide. And the reason that I like to start by sharing myths, and these are the same myths I've shared for years and years and years because they still exist, um, is that I want to kind of set the stage for having a clear understanding as to how do we think about suicide? Because all of us, probably in our own mind, when we hear that word, we think certain things. And our interpretation, our impression of it is going to impact how we interact with people that could be at risk for suicide. And so what I'd like to do is kind of share some myths, get those things out of the way first so that we're all kind of on an even playing ground as we move forward. So the first myth I'd like to talk about is that suicides happen without warning. Now I will say, there's a couple of these myths that are going to be harder to digest if you have been directly affected by suicide. What I want you to do is not just look at the myth on the top, but hear what we're talking about as we go through this, because it's easy to read that sentence up there. If you've lost somebody to suicide, 
that doesn't feel like a myth to you. And we'll, I'll, I'll put it in a different context so you'll understand. There'll be another one that will come up at the end and you're gonna feel similarly, I think about that too. But again, please listen to the whole thing. Don't get caught up in just the beginning of it, right? Suicides happen without warning. That's the first myth. Now, the challenge with it is that um, if we look at media reporting, for example, which interestingly and, and thankfully, I think the media has really, I don't know if shied away is the right way of describing it, but they're not reporting suicides as frequently as they used to report. But certainly when they had reported them in the past, the discussion was always, the, the content of that article always seemed to suggest that nobody had a clue that this was something that could happen. And the reason why that's what happens is that the journalists get there and their job is to tell a story and they've learned about something that's happened. They've gone to go, you know, investigate, get their research to write up their story. You know, particularly if it's a young person, they want to interact with family members. They want to talk to somebody who knew this person really, really well. And so they always ask what seems to be the most absurd question that you will ever imagine hearing, which is, did you have any idea? Like, did you see this coming? Now, keep in mind that family members, usually within the first you know, day or two of this, are still in a state of shock, that they are unable to process and understand and make sense out of this whole conversation. Here you have a journalist trying to ask you if you had seen this coming. What are they supposed to say? And if we really think about it, the answer is always no. If they had seen it coming, would they not have done something? Of course, not one person have I ever met that has been directly affected by suicide has ever said to me, I saw it coming and would have done nothing about it. That is, I, I don't know that I will ever hear someone tell me that. But the problem is, of course, they say, no, we didn't see it. Of course, because again, they're still in a state of shock and, and they wouldn't have seen it in that moment. You know, hindsight's 2020, that's a different issue. And then the story continues with how everybody describes this person as, you know, well-liked, lots of friends, certainly not anybody that anyone would have anticipated could have been at risk for suicide. And these stories then have been historically published, which suggests that these things just happen out of the blue. The reality is that most people who have thoughts of suicide, who ultimately engage in suicidal behaviors, particularly in lethal behaviors, have expressed those thoughts to somebody. Now, it isn't always directly. It's not always um, in a way that's very clear. And sometimes it happens that they are sharing their thoughts about things in contexts that, I don't wanna say are encoded, but that, that people can't quite fully appreciate and understand what they're saying. I'll just give you an example. So we, um, years ago, I had a Swarthmore student who was interested in, in social media and its impact on suicide. And so we went to the One Crisis Center in Philadelphia and worked with um, and talked to families and talked specifically to the teenagers that were in there and asked them to report what were the last five things that they had indicated about their you know, thoughts and feelings on social media prior to them coming to the crisis center. And then we had measures of their suicidal thoughts and we had measures of depression and we knew who had made suicide attempts in the past, how many attempts, et cetera. And so we were able to take those statements that they had posted online and we can match those up to the individuals in different groups. So you had a group that we would argue is sort of the highest risk group. And these are the folks that maybe have made multiple suicide attempts that are currently having suicidal thoughts. Maybe they're even depressed. You then have a sort of the moderate group in the middle who might have some of those things, but not all of those things. And you had another group that was lower risk for suicide. Either they'd never had suicidal thoughts in the past, they don't report being depressed, no previous suicide attempts, that they were in the crisis center for something completely different. We didn't wanna say they are at no risk for suicide, but they're certainly lower risk. And so you have these statements, you can match them up with these different groups in terms of risk categories. And then we created a little survey and took it to a quote unquote normal population in pediatrics office where everybody goes. And we said, you know, if you saw these statements, A, how concerned would you be? And B, what would you do about it? And what we found in hindsight wasn't terribly shocking. What we found was that regardless of who the statement had come from, the kids would basically say they weren't terribly concerned about it. 
Why? They saw this stuff all the time. Social media was saturated with, with people saying, life sucks, I don't wanna be here anymore, and all this other stuff that was on there to the point where the kids were like, I can't tell the difference between this statement and the next statement. And we knew who the statements had come from. And so we had a clue as to which statements were from the highest risk people and which were from lower risk. But the kids who were reading the statements had no clue. And would they have done anything about it? No, why? Because they weren't sure if they should be concerned about it and they didn't wanna be intrusive. The point is this, that most people, again, who make suicide attempts or even die by suicide have communicated that to people in some which way, shape or form. They don't always do it directly. So therefore it's hard to see it, but we gotta be more attuned to it. And hopefully we'll, we'll have a little bit of that knowledge when we leave here today. The second myth is suicide is an act of aggression, anger, or revenge. That, that I am getting back at somebody through this particular behavior. And that's why I'm doing it. My death somehow is revenge for something that someone else has done. First of all, if we really stop and think logically about it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And, and having worked in the behavioral health field for going on 20 years now, I can tell you I've worked with a lot of people who have been aggressive, angry, and vengeful. Um, not one of them wanted to end their own life in a method to get back at anyone else. Because when they engaged in revenge behaviors or anger or something, they wanted to see how other people responded to it. Death is not a way or an opportunity for them to do so. The other part of it though, that we know is that most people who die do so not because they're angry at others or vengeful towards others, or they're not doing it necessarily aggressively. They're doing it because they feel like they don't belong. They feel like they're a burden on other people. They actually think quite the opposite of the myth. In other words, their death will free other people of this particular burden. So oftentimes suicides occur in ways and places that don't gather a lot of attention. They're not there for the shock value and so on. Occasionally that does happen, but many, many, many more so than otherwise happen in more private kind of settings than others. I worked with a kid once who we were screening um, a bunch of adolescents through a primary care office. This was years ago. I used to work at CHOP and um, there was an adolescent medicine clinic across the street from our office. And we were screening all the kids that had come through there. And these kids that were coming in um, were getting screened for depression and suicidal thoughts. And we had this one boy who was, I think he was like 13, maybe 14, but I think he was more 13, had come in, screened high for both depression and suicidal thoughts. And we came over and I walked across the street. I met with him and had a conversation. What I learned was this that the day before, he was there for a well visit. His mom had taken him because, well, it was his annual pediatrics visit and that's why he was showing up. Um, the day before, however, he had come home from school. His parents are typically not there when he comes home from school. His plan was to end his life. He had gone into his parents' bedroom, got his father's gun and was on his bed preparing to end his own life when his dad got home from work earlier than he typically would have. Instead of pulling the trigger, he hid the gun underneath the pillow. He waited till his dad was out of the way so he could put the gun back. He didn't want to do this in a way where he want, he didn't want his dad to feel like he could save him. He didn't want his dad to hear, see, be responsible for it. There was no anger and aggression or revenge involved in the behavior, even though the kid quite readily said that he was having issues with his parents. He wasn't about to do this. So again, still wanted to do this privately. The, the, the wonderful thing about this example obviously is this kid by chance had a well visit appointment the very next day. Nobody had a clue what had happened the day before. Nobody would have known what happened the day before. He shows up for his well visit. He tells us he's depressed. He tells us he's suicidal. He tells us he's gonna go home and do this again. So he's one of the few kids that I've ever hospitalized um, in my career of working with suicidal kids because at this stage, we know the risk is really high. We know his access to something that could end his own life. And so we, we tried to keep him safe for that time being. This third myth is what's kept this discussion out of schools for years and years and years. If we talk about suicide, people are more likely to do this. 
the fear had always been if I were to go into one of the high schools in Downingtown and stand up there in front of the auditorium in front of 500 students and talk about suicide prevention, all the good stuff, you know, the, the, like what to be looking for, how to pay attention to this, how can you help your friends, who are the adults in school and outside of school that you can reach out to for support, all that kind of stuff. First of all, we would never do it and don't ever do this in front of an entire school. Not a good idea. And the reason why is there's 500 kids sitting there and you have no idea how they are responding individually to what you're talking about. In a group of 20, yes, you can see it. In a group of 500, you don't see it. But the point is, had we mistakenly done this anyway, 500 kids in this auditorium, what would happen after that talk is that Sarah and her team of all these folks they would have a line of students popping into their office the rest of the day. And what would they be telling us? They themselves have thoughts of suicide or someone they know does. And the old school thing that went into this myth was this belief that by having this conversation in school, we somehow have planted this idea that these kids should be suicidal. I would argue it's the complete opposite of that. Having this conversation with these kids suddenly makes it okay. It creates an environment by which it might be safe to talk about. These kids may have wanted to talk to their parents about it, but they were afraid that their parents would be frightened and scared and not know what to do. And so they can't talk to them. They're scared to talk to their friends perhaps about it because the thought is, well, if I tell my friend about it, they might tell my parents and then we're back to where we were before. And I don't know what to do at that point in time. But suddenly this conversation in school has led me to believe that maybe I could talk to somebody here. You know, the guy in the front of the auditorium told me I could go down to Ms. Brooks' office. I could talk to her. You know, so this is where we go with this whole thing. And so we know that there are no what we call iatrogenic effects. There was a study that was done 15 years ago, wonderful study that showed that if you ask kids about suicide, you did not suddenly plant this idea into their head. You do not make them suicidal by asking them. In fact, asking people that are suicidal, if they're having thoughts about suicide, creates an opportunity to actually do something. So having that conversation puts the opportunity in place where we can perhaps intervene. And once we know what's going on, guess what? Then we can do something. We can intervene, we can refer them somewhere, we can get them some help, support, et cetera. And if the conversation never happens in the first place, guess what? We don't do anything for them. Next myth, people who talk about suicide aren't serious about killing themselves. This is an interesting thought because you know, people often say, well, if they really want to die, why would they tell you? Because if they tell you, you might do something to stop them. All right, I'm going to go back to my own experience, having done this for about 20 years and worked like almost exclusively with suicidal individuals for probably 15, 16 of those years. Everybody who comes into my office who starts the conversation with, I just want to die. First of all, I probably already know because I've spoken to somebody else on the phone before they've gotten into my office. Um, but they all are aware of the limitations. They are all aware of what I can and cannot withhold from other people. They are all aware of this, but yet they tell me anyway. The worry is that the idea behind this is if people are talking about ending their own life, then they actually don't really want to do it. That's really the other way to think about this myth. And we know that that's not necessarily true. The problem is that, as I said before, People who want to die often express it to others. The problem is that sometimes the receivers of the message get really uncomfortable by it. They may not take them seriously. They're not quite sure. And, and the truth is, we'll talk about this at the end in terms of being responsive. You know, as a parent, if your kid tells you they're having thoughts of suicide, your first thought is, no, you're not. <laughs> Wave the magic wand, it's going to go away. And it isn't that we deny it because we believe that's gonna suddenly miraculously make it disappear. We want to deny it because we don't want them to hurt. But we struggle oftentimes with how do I be responsive to it? And so we're gonna talk about that more as we go through tonight, but that sort of perpetuates this myth a little bit. It gets further complicated by this idea that, you know, people who are engaging in suicidal behavior, they're just simply trying to get attention. Now, the interesting thing about this is maybe that is partially true for some people, but I wouldn't say they are just trying to get attention. I don't think that's the case probably ever. 
Um, the example I like to give for this is, is another case that I saw years ago. Um, I've used this example for a dozen years because once I heard this, I don't know that I'm ever going to find a better example for this. Um, again, same environment. I was, you know, we were screening people in a, in a primary care office. And this is a 14, 15 year old, I think she's a 15 year old girl who had come in. She'd actually come into the primary care office for family planning. So she was there to get contraception, had shown up after school. Um, her parents were unaware that she was over there, her mom, I should say was unaware that she was over there. Um, and HIPAA laws actually prevented the providers from actually telling her parents why she was there because family planning is also protected. So she's allowed to go over there and, and get birth control pills and her parents don't have to be informed of this whole kind of thing. So this is the context. So she comes over there, she's doing that, just happens to be showing up and we're screening everybody. So she shows up as having some thoughts of, of suicide, um, also reporting enough depression to meet criteria for a study we were looking at. So I get called by the social worker over there. I come over to meet with her. She indicates, yes, she's been having some thoughts of suicide. Yes, she's been depressed for a while. Um, and yes, she wants some help. And we had a study going on at the time where they were being offered uh, free family therapy or referrals into the community where they could get whatever care they can get there, we would help assist getting those connections. And she wanted it. She wanted to be a part of that. Her mom wasn't there with her. So we had to sit there and say, okay, well, we got to give mom a call. Like, can mom come in so we can talk about this? And she was like, sure, you can call my mother. So we called mom, mom didn't answer. So mom doesn't answer. Um, she says, well, oh, she must still be at work. She should be home in about an hour. Now, I did a fairly thorough assessment of her. I shouldn't say fairly. I did a thorough assessment of her. We decided that she was safe enough to go home. She wasn't at imminent risk that she was going to go home and die. Um, and again, she wanted help. And she'd actually, she, she went to a school that was directly across the street from my office, too, that we were doing some work with the school. And she basically said, listen, if, if, uh, if you don't get in touch with my mom today, you need to check in with me tomorrow. You're welcome to come over to the school and check in with me over there, I'll be at school. I said, okay. We knew how to get in touch with her because of the primary care office as well. So um, she goes home about an hour later, I go to make this call to her mother. And I have to tell you, the thing I was most worried about was I'm getting ready to call a mother. I'm a psychologist who just met with your daughter in a primary care office that you had no clue that she was going to. And you have no idea why she was going. And oh, by the way, I cannot tell you why she was going there because of privacy laws. So my first concern is how in the world do I start this conversation with his mother? Because she's gonna wonder, well, why in the world were you seeing my daughter and how did come you were seeing her at the primary care office? It didn't make a whole lot of sense. So I call the mom on the phone and she answers. And um, interestingly, she doesn't question me at all about why I just met with her daughter. Um, which probably should have been my first clue that this is gonna be an interesting conversation. And then I don't like to beat around the bush. So fairly quickly, I, I got to say to her, you know, do you realize that sometimes your daughter feels so awful that she feels like ending her own life? And the mother says something to me that I, again, I've been sharing this for 12 years. I don't know when I'm gonna find a different story that fits this better, but she said something to me I'd never heard before. I don't know if I'm ever gonna hear again. She says, I don't care if she wants to kill herself. She just needs to go to school. So I said, I thought, interesting. My first other thought was I was glad I was on the other side of a phone because I don't know if my chin was on the floor. I'm not sure what look I had on my face. I was just thrilled we weren't doing this through this video kind of context. Like, you know, 12 years ago, we weren't doing this, which thankfully, because I don't know what I was doing. I know that my immediate thought was, well, if she's dead, she's not going to school. But I didn't say that. So as she continued, she was telling me how she's been called by the school before, she's been called by the crisis center before. Every time her daughter doesn't get what she wants, she tells someone she wants to kill herself and the red flags go up everywhere. Then she gets called out of work and she's got to deal with this. And it was a real, it, it, and she didn't believe a word she had to say. And this was kind of where the whole thing was going. Now, there may have been, a, I didn't get the sense from the girl that she was simply trying to get attention. 
the sense that I got from her from meeting with her previously that day was that, yeah, she was having some thoughts of suicide. She was able to articulate what those were about. It wasn't about, oh, my mom doesn't give me everything I want. It, you know, there were other things going on too. The problem was the mother just kept talking and I couldn't get a word in edgewise. And so she's talking and talking and talking about how she's just trying to get attention. This is so unimportant. Why do I always get burdened at work and blah, 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 and all this other stuff. And I'm trying to offer free therapy. And to which she's saying, I don't want that. She doesn't need that. She simply needs to be in school, blah, you know, and it's going on and on and on. I'm thinking this is not good because the girl's also probably at the house listening to her mother talk about her. And I can't be there to be helpful to kind of navigate all this. And again, in person, I can, you know how you can kind of lean forward or you can kind of make a motion or something. Someone knows you're getting ready to talk. When you have a phone to your ear, you don't see the person making that motion saying that they want to talk so that you sit back and give them space to say anything. So I wasn't getting a word in edgewise. Eventually she takes a breath. This is probably a half an hour in. I mean, it went on for quite a while. And I took a risk and I said to her, you know, it sounds like that your daughter's behavior, when she says that she's having thoughts of suicide, that behavior is a real burden on you. It means that you got to get pulled away from work. It means that you have to do things that you weren't planning on doing. It complicates a lot of stuff for you. And she responded to me in the affirmative. I won't tell you exactly what she said because I don't want to repeat it in front of a hundred different people here. I'll just say that she said yes in a very colorful way. Um, and so I felt a little bit relieved that at least I, I took the risk and I got it right. And I said to her, what if we work together so that we can teach your daughter how to better express how, what she needs and how she feels in a way that if she needs attention, she asks for attention. If she needs affection, she asks for affection. If she needs 20 bucks, she asks for 20 bucks. But if she's feeling suicidal, she can say to you that she's feeling suicidal and you know that's how she really feels. In other words, if we can teach her how to express this stuff, perhaps it will take the burden off of you of how to respond. She's like, when do you sign, like, how do I sign up? And so they start coming in for family therapy starting the next, you know, next day they show up in the office to kind of get scheduled for their intake and all that. Six weeks into treatment, the mother says the two most powerful words in therapy, which is she turns to her daughter after they've been discussing this again for, you know, once a week for six weeks and says to her, I'm sorry. She says, I had no idea that this is how you really felt. And the daughter owns up herself and she says, you know what, I'm sorry too said, most of the time I was suicidal and that's how I really felt. And I didn't know how to express it. I didn't know how to tell you what it was. But yeah, every once in a while, I did pull the suicide card out because I wanted something else. And so I can see how you were confused by it and stuff like that. What happened at that moment is the two of them had a different understanding of each other, of how to communicate with each other. And guess who wasn't feeling so suicidal anymore? This girl, because she knew that if she, told, if she told her mother about it, her mother would be attentive to those thoughts and feelings and wouldn't assume that she was simply trying to get something that she couldn't get. The point with this whole story is our job is to take all mentions of suicide seriously. It might be that they're trying to get attention, maybe. But we make a high risk of a catastrophic mistake by treating it like it's attention seeking every single time when we don't know that that's what it is. What we want to do is help people effectively express how they feel, express their needs in ways so that the communication can be clear and obvious and everybody knows what's on the same page. And so that's, you know, that's what we're trying to accomplish with this. So normally when there's an audience and we do some in-person interaction. This is like the problem with this is that what I'm going to tell you is read this statement and tell me what's wrong with the statement. Like, what would you change about this statement? And there's nobody here who can tell me what the answer to that is because I can't hear you. But take out the word suicidal, read the whole thing over again. Teens overreact to life events. Now I see Chrissy and Sarah both smiling on their face like, yeah, yeah, this is true. It would only be fair to say that that's true if we don't, if we also acknowledge that when we were kids, we did the same thing. 
How many times do you remember with your own folks, something going on, like you were having a bad, crappy day in school, something's going on, your parents are like, what's up? And you're just like, ah, you know, kids overreact to things that are going on because they don't recognize that this is just a blip in the radar and things will get better and move forward. The problem is the perception at that moment is that everything is terrible. And when we talk about kids that are having thoughts of suicide, that moment, that perception that something awful is happening can predict behavior later on, which is a problem, right? So what we know is that we as adults, we have 2020 hindsight, we see all of this stuff. We, you know, we look at our 15, 16 year old kids and we say to them, you know, I get it. You know, Bobby broke up with you. This is a big deal. It's not going to be a big deal tomorrow. And in a month when you're dating some other kid, Bobby won't have made a bit of difference at all. We can sit there and go, I remember all this stuff when I was a kid. What happens though, is when we take that approach with our kids, they think you don't have a clue. You do not understand. You don't know what it's like to be a teenager these days. And any parent out there who hasn't heard that from their own kid, you need to do your own webinar. Teach us how to get to that spot because every kid thinks that their parents are clueless. They can't, we're ancient. We're way too old to understand what it's like to be a teenager these days. The problem is when we minimize their own struggles, because we might be right and think, you know, this is going to be okay in a day or two. But when we minimize their struggles when it's happening, the problem is for them, they think we don't get it. And then they don't turn to us when they need help. The other piece of it is we have to remember perceived crises are just as concerning and predictive of suicidal behavior as actual crises can be. Um, an example I give sometimes for this is I, I've given this talk sometimes to um, schools, to teachers, and you'll get, you know, it's, it's a different thing to have a hundred of them in an auditorium. You can kind of get a read a little bit differently from that audience. Although some of them are obviously very much affected by suicide too. And every time I give a talk in front of a school district with all the teachers, they guarantee the superintendent is always there. They are always there. They want to know what's this guy saying do I need to, like, when he leaves, remind people about some other things that we're going to do different than what he says? Or, you know, some of them are there and they're like, what can we do different in our policies to understand things, whatever. But the point is, superintendent's always there. And so, you know, I've given a talk before a couple of times where I have an auditorium, 100 teachers or whatever. And I say, all right, let's pretend Dr. So-and-so, you know, Dr. Smith here, superintendent, um, is going to pass out, he's got 10 pink slips. She's gonna pass out 10 pink slips today. 10 of you guys are losing your jobs. Now we all know I'm fabricating this whole thing. I'm making it up. This is not a real story, but for a second, people get a little anxious. I say, so how many of you, so I give it a second because you see this reaction on everybody. And it's like, it always amazes me because like, I'm totally making this crap up. Like how in the world are you actually falling for this stuff? <laughs> But if you give it a second, everyone settles down. And I say, how many of you were not at all concerned by that statement that I just said? What happens is you see like two or three or four hands raised. You know who's raising their hands? The people that are just getting ready to retire. They're like, listen, I've got a year to go. This is my last year teaching. I was thinking maybe one more year after this. If I get the pink slip today, so be it. Those are the only people who didn't get upset by the statement. The point is, we all know it was never going to happen, but the perception that something bad could happen still provoked some level of anxiety in people. And that's what this is really about. And then finally, the last myth before we get into the warning signs and what to do, suicide cannot be prevented. Now, this is the other one that, like I said, if you have been affected directly by suicide, this statement hurts. Um, because it suggests, oh, you could have done something different. I'm not saying that at all. Uh, and I fully recognize that there is a probably completely unwarranted sense of guilt that happens in most people who have lost a loved one to suicide about what has occurred that could I have done something different. So this is not about that. This is an understanding that... Um, 
everybody is sort of on, I, I think about it this way, everyone's sort of on a trajectory in life. They're heading in a certain direction. I fully appreciate that some people get to the end of the line, so to speak, and shifting course is very, very difficult. Very, very difficult. My argument is that that trajectory took a much longer course than that day or that week or that month or whatever is going on. And could we have done something before that time that could have made a difference? What we don't know directly is the impact that we have on the lives of young people and the statements that we make and the, our ability to listen, our ability to appreciate, you know, all of those kinds of things, I think, can make differences in people's lives. The other side of all of this is that in the moments when people are struggling the most, what can we do to be helpful? You know, can we be helpful in these times when they're really, really struggling the most? This is what we'll talk about here in a second. We know that most acute crises only last a couple of days. In fact, the insurance companies use these data as a you know, justification for three days in the hospital, we kick you out. You know, people tend to get better in, in a matter of a couple of days, so we kick them out. Um, if we can impact someone's life during those times that they're struggling, we often can at least change that course for the moment. Now, it may mean we're gonna have to change the course again down the road and again down the road and so on and so forth. I talk to behavioral health professionals about something called safety planning, which is how to develop strategies, not for people, but with people that are suicidal, they come up with their own plans as to what they can do that they've done in the past when they've been struggling to get through these moments. The whole point of a safety plan is not to have it be therapy that suddenly like using my safety plan makes me feel better. No, no, no. The point of the safety plan is when you are at the very end of it all, the safety plan is there to prevent you from doing the behavior that ends your life. And if we can get past that moment, then we have an opportunity to do something therapeutic to intervene and help. So there's that piece of it. The other thing that I like to end with when it comes to these myths and, and this statement right here is people that come into my office, I usually know, particularly teenagers, for example, somebody's called me ahead of time. I already know why they're coming in. You know, I've already had a conversation with mom or dad or grandparent or whomever it happens to be. So I know why they're there. I know they've had thoughts of suicide. I know they may have made suicide attempts in the past. I know all of that kind of stuff. But what happens is they end up in my office and I ask them, how did you get here? And the question isn't, mom drove me. Like, no, no, no. How did you get here? In the midst of the worst moment of your life, how did you go from that to getting in my office? And while there is some range to the responses that I've gotten, the ones that stick out for me the most tend to be people that say something along the lines of this. When I was struggling the most and I didn't want to be here anymore, oftentimes, maybe even later, they'll tell you they were trying to push people away sometimes. Some of this self-fulfilling prophecy. It's like, if I believe I'm worthless and I'm no good and stuff like that, if I treat people awfully and say terrible things to them, they're gonna tell me what a jerk I am. Guess what? They suddenly reinforce the belief that I have about myself. Now I set myself up to get that, but they may not see it completely that way. The point is they've tried to push people away. When I was trying to push people away, what has happened is this, somebody won't leave me alone, whether that's figuratively or literally, they will not leave me alone. So when somebody says, how are you doing? I will say, I'm fine. They don't believe me because I don't look like I'm fine. I'm acting differently. Whatever it is they've picked up on, they say, no, you're not. What's going on? And they've stuck with me long enough that I was able to start to talk about how I felt such that that person connected me to whomever to whomever to get me here in your office. In other words, we know that a caring, concerned individual can help someone in distress by simply listening and paying attention to them. And we know that if we can take people's feelings seriously, acknowledge them for what they are struggling with and truly listen to them, it can perhaps be life-saving. We know that it by itself may not be everything that's needed to make life better, but in the moment it can save a life. 
So those are my myths. It takes a while to get through all that stuff, but I do it intentionally because I want to set the stage for kind of, if we don't understand what we're talking about, then the rest of the stuff doesn't matter. I am going to talk a little bit about some data stuff. Um, this is, or these are the, the 2018 leading causes of death by the CDC. Now, this is a terrible thing to look at. If you're looking at this on your phone, for example, you're going, why did he do this to us? The, the green boxes are suicide deaths. The blue are unintentional injuries. Red is homicide. White are all these different medical conditions that lead to morbidity and mortality in this country. If we look at our older teenagers, sort of a high school, college age, what you see there is about 6,200 suicides in 2018. That number has gone up again and again and again and again for years and years and years. It's the second leading cause of death in young people in middle school and high school ages across this country. Um, we know there are suicides in that top category too. It's just they don't get classified that way in the coroner's office because there wasn't a note, or there was some, there was not enough evidence to support it, but we know there are certainly suicides in that group. We just don't know how many. What I can tell you is a 2019 data just came out last week. Unfortunately, the table like this hasn't been pushed out yet, so I haven't seen that directly. For the first time in many, many, many years, the suicide, the total number of suicide deaths in 2019 is less than it was in 2018. It's gone up for, I forget how many years in a row, but it's gone up for almost 20 years in a row. Now, it's easy to look at that and get excited by that. I'm not minimizing that by any stretch. What I will tell you is if we looked over a period of a decade and for nine years it went up and one of those years it cracked down a little bit and went up, you're still gonna see a massive difference between point one and point two, or, or year one and year 10. Um, it's a good start. We'll have to wait and see kind of what things look like in 2020. Um, we can talk about that in the Q and A if you wanna know more about what we think about those kinds of things. The data is just not in yet. So if you, if you want to know what the, the data is telling us, we, we simply don't have a clear answer just yet. Um, you know, but anyway, it's, 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 a, it's a good thing to see the difference kind of like that. This is looking at suicide rates, again, males and females over the lifespan. There's two major times where the slope of these lines are different. The first is kind of end of life, which is an interesting thing, not what we're talking about here. But you see in sort of your post um, retirement years, the suicide rate in women go down, the rate in men goes, goes up quite a bit. Um, different discussion, not what we're talking about today. I, you know, I think it has to do with connection, but that's a different issue. Um, and the other place where you see a massive difference is in our adolescent group, where the rates for boys go up at a different rate than it does for the girls. The rates for girls still go up. I mean, don't, don't be fooled. That line's not a straight line. That's going up too. It tends to be historically related to access to lethal means, although we're seeing some differences there too in terms of access to firearms and so on and so forth, which gets us to the discussion about means and why these make a difference. So this is uh, 2017 data because we don't have this table for 2018 yet. Um, when you're looking at 10 to 24 year olds, that's how the CDC groups it. So this is all of our middle school and high school age kids. You know, firearms account for almost 50% of suicide deaths in this age group. Suffocation is almost 40%. Um, that includes anything that involves asphyxiation, hanging falls under that category, which tends to be the number one method within that group. Um, poisoning is overdose and a whole host of other things like that. So it's important to think a little bit about the firearm thing. I'm not going to go into a big long spiel about this. What I wanna say is that the data is clear that we know, these are older data, I think these are 2014 data. You know, firearms across all ages accounted for just over 50% of suicide deaths, but it accounted for only about 5% of total suicide attempts. Why the lethality? That's the clear answer. It's the most lethal method. It is the one method that we know um, much greater chance of death than, than without. What that means from a prevention perspective is that individuals who are suicidal who have access to firearms in their home, the likelihood of them dying is greater than if there is anything else in their home for them. And there is numerous data points that suggest this to be the case. In fact, there was a study done like 30 years ago, almost at this point in time, um, by David Brent out in Pittsburgh, actually, where he looked at adolescents who had died by suicide and compared them to adolescents who had made suicide attempts and were in a psychiatric hospital after the attempt and was able to do what they call psychological autopsy studies, which is to 
basically they interviewed families and people that knew those that had died um, to gather information to see what they could understand about the individuals who had died by suicide so that we could work on preventative measures moving forward. But by doing so, they had a lot of data on them. And so they were able to compare um, those who died to those who did not die. And they were basically put it into a nice little statistical model where they were trying to predict based on all these variables, who was in the group that lived and who was in the group that died. And all of the variables showed no difference whatsoever, except for access to a gun. If you had a gun in your house, you were two and a half times more likely to be in the group that died than to be in the group that lived. Then the question of course is where is it kept? This, these are data from individuals who had died by suicide using a firearm. What they found is the vast majority of them had the gun in their house. Very few people go across the street to a neighbor's house, to a friend's house, wherever to get access to a gun to use that in their own suicide death. And very few people, the bottom line there, very few people go out and purchase a gun with the intent of using that within two weeks of the purchase to end their own life. The point is guns that are accessible in the home when people are suicidal is not a good formula for success. <laughs> All right. Shifting gears again, let's talk about warning signs for youth suicide. This is an important thing because we could talk about risk factors all night tonight, talk about it through the night into tomorrow, talk about it all day tomorrow, we go on and on and on. A risk factor is simply anything that increases somebody's risk for suicidal behavior. The truth is that almost everybody has some risk factor for suicide. Depending on what category we're thinking about, what we're talking about, there's lots of things that increase people's risk. Not one of those things necessarily makes somebody also be more likely to be suicidal itself. Okay, it doesn't make them suicidal, I guess that's what I mean. So for example, we used to do something with our medical students like back when we had in-person classes. Um, you know, there'd be 250 of them in an auditorium. I'd be doing a lecture on suicide risk and I'd ask them, you know, and this was torturous, so I didn't make it last long and then they fully understood what I was getting at when I got done with it. because. I'm going to say it and you're going, oh my God, that was terrible. Why'd you do that to them? Um, I would say, hey, you know, after I've shared all the data, I'd say, so what I want you to do is take a quick look around the room and let's see if we can identify who might be, who of the might be at the highest risk for suicide. And they all sit there and like, the thing about this that's problematic is they look around the room and they're thinking, how often does this person go to class or that? Like, you know, what do I know about these people? But there are certainly people in the room that you know are thinking, I hope they don't at me. So very quickly after they start this thing, I quickly raise my hand and it's almost like kindergarten. You raise your hand, everyone stops. <laughs> so they stop talking and they look up front. He's going to tell us the answer. And I keep my hand up and they're looking like, okay, who is it? And I raise my hand and it's like, it's me. I'm the white middle-aged guy in the room. You go by the data, that's me. It doesn't mean that I'm suicidal, but by a risk factor, it's me. And, you know, some of them are like, oh, okay. And some of them are like, thank goodness. You know, but the point is, Risk factors don't tell us who's going to die by suicide. Warning signs, however, are what happens in the moments, the hours, the days, up to a week or so before somebody makes a life-threatening suicide attempt. This is what we have seen. So this is it in a nutshell. There are four major categories of things. The first one is the obvious one, but it's the one that we don't like to hear and think about, right? The kid who's talking about or making plans for suicide, that's the obvious one. We simply cannot ignore that anymore. The second one is a sense of hopelessness about the future. And this is not the kid that's like, I got to tell you, I'll, 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 uh, are we recording this, Chrissy? Oh, crap. All right. I'm trying to think, like, how much do I tell you? No, it's like, you know, I'll, I'll give you the example, right? I have, I'll readily admit, I have a junior in high school right now, not in your district, but I have a junior in high school right now. Um, right now, COVID sucks for people in that grade in high school, and we are not in the school building and haven't been in for 10 months. So you can sit there and go, what in the world is this doing to my future? And argue that left and right. There is a sense of hopelessness about that, but I think most kids who are not absorbed in depression or not having suicidal thoughts, that hopelessness can quickly be swept away with this is not going to last forever and things can get better and I can still make a difference, blah, 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 and stuff like that. 
you also have to remember that people are having thoughts of suicide. It is never the case that they want to just live with thoughts of suicide. We're not gonna to try to get better. No, no, no. Everyone has been trying to do things to make their life better. Nobody wants to feel suicidal. They're of course trying to help themselves out. The problem is whether it be through actual events or their own perception of what is going on around them, it doesn't feel like things are improving. And so they're trying and it doesn't seem to work for whatever reason. They try something else, that doesn't seem to work for whatever reason. They try something else, doesn't seem to work. And at some point in time, it turns into nothing works. Nothing's going to work. And therefore, what's the point? So that's where the hopelessness falls in. Now, it's not, not the only way hopelessness falls in. But hopelessness is not simply, oh, it's not going to get better when eventually there's some understanding that it probably will. The third is severe, overwhelming emotional pain or distress. This is interesting because it's something that people who, like this, we got a lot of this from survey data, as well as a lot of national and international experts kind of coming together and having this conversation. But um, one of the things that comes out of this is that if you talk to people who had made life-threatening suicide attempts, they'll tell you this is how they felt right before that behavior. When you talk to people who lost young people to suicide, they will often also indicate this is what I saw right before they died but I never would have been able to put it in those terms at the moment, but looking back on it in hindsight, that's it. They were not, they didn't feel the same as they did before. They looked like they were struggling with something. And the good news is that, they, that the people who had made the suicide attempts and survived gave us enough information to understand, well, what does that look like and how might we see that? What they said is that oftentimes this looks like the person who has just this range of emotions occurring all at once. The person who looks angry, but tearful, sad, but frustrated, you know, all of this kind of stuff bent, you know, kind of pent up together and they can't sort of separate those kinds of things. Someone sort of described it, it's kind of like having a migraine headache where you get tearful when you're having a migraine headache. And the response the person said was it, it, the tearfulness doesn't come from it hurts. The tearfulness comes from the frustration of here we go again and I don't want to feel this way. So that's that emotional distress that goes along with it. Then finally, the last set of warning signs is really a cluster of behavioral cues. And, and as parents, what I would say is, you know your kids as well as anyone. And so these are things, if it's worrisome to you, then it's probably worrisome, we should be paying attention to it. So we don't wanna argue over semantics as to like how much of this has to be happening. If you're worried by it, that's enough. This has to be different from how they typically have been in the past. And certainly in the presence of any of these other warning signs, we wanna be very concerned about it. So the things include withdrawal from or changes in social connections or situations. We have to put that in the context of what's going on in the world right now. Um, so it's a little bit different, but it doesn't mean that it's completely different. So this is just because they may not be involved in a whole bunch of in-school um, groups and clubs and activities and after-school stuff because some of those things are simply limited by COVID. It, that doesn't mean this. Now, if they are limited from these things for other reasons, but are then choosing not to participate in things that they could participate in, that's a different issue. So that's the person who, you know, the club is no longer meeting in person, but they're meeting virtually after school, but they're still not going. Now, some of those kids are not going because they're staring at a screen all day long and they said, listen, I can't do it anymore. That's a different issue too. But you know, for the ones that really enjoy that stuff and they're getting, they're kind of withdrawing from it. You don't have to withdraw from everything either. It's just, you know, the things that seem to be really important kind of pulling back from that. Uh, increase in agitation or irritability. All right, so here we go back to COVID, right? And all the kids that are frustrated by this, some of the things that they can't do and everybody's irritated and frustrated. We have to separate the behavior from the context of what's going on around you. So it can't simply be everybody's irritated and frustrated. So everybody's then at risk for suicide that's not really the argument we want to make here. The point is, is it out of character, out of context for who they are? Is it increased from how they typically behave? Um, and so on. Same with uh, anger or hostility. So it's different from how they usually behave or how they usually are, or it's out of the context. It's different than what everybody else is kind of responding to. And then finally, the last one is something we talked about at the beginning around depression, which is changes in sleep. So this is the kid who's sleeping a lot more or sleeping a lot less. 
you know, and it's different than the kid who stays up until three o'clock in the morning because that new, you know, Netflix series came on and they were like, oh, I got to watch that. And they started watching that. And six hours later, they realized, oh, it's three in the morning. I got to get up in a couple of hours. I should probably turn this off. And then the next morning, what are they doing? You know, they're in, uh, they're in their hybrid virtual classroom that day. And this is what the teachers see, you know, the head on the desk or on, sitting on their computer and they're asleep or they've turned off their screen or their image because they're taking a nap or whatever, or in the classroom, their head's down and they're sleeping. That's different. So we have to keep it in context, but these have been shown to be uh, warning signs that expert panel has agreed upon um, that, uh, you know, again, this is within the up to a week prior to suicidal behaviors. These are the things that we see most frequently. And again, just because you have all of these things also doesn't mean the suicidal behavior is going to happen either. That's the problem. It's not like we don't have a perfect algorithm. If we had a perfect algorithm, those suicide numbers would go down dramatically because we would know, okay, that person is in this situation, boom, they're the ones. It isn't like that. If it were like that, it would be so much easier to, to be preventative here. The goal though is to see these in context, understand it and intervene, which brings us to our last part here, which is what in the world can we do? So you notice these things in a kid, it could be your own, it could be one of their friends, whatever. What's the first thing that you should do? It seems obvious, but it's one of the hardest things. And that is talk to them, ask them if they're okay. The second half of this sentence isn't really like, ask them if they're okay and do you wanna die? That's, that's not how we start the conversation. It's a reminder, however, that if they tell us they're not doing really well and you're really concerned about them, if you ask them if they're having thoughts of suicide, you're not planting some idea into their mind that they should be suicidal. You might actually be freeing them up. They may not be able to tell you that that's what they're thinking because they don't know how to express it. They're not quite sure what you're gonna say, but if you ask them and they say yes, then you have freed them the opportunity to express it and to share it and to talk about it. The point though is we have to start the conversation in the first place and asking them if they're okay is the beginning of the conversation. Now it's not adequate just to do that, but it's important to start that. And we have to remember that asking that, are you okay question is important and it's different than the typical social pleasantries that we do all the time. So I, I can see a couple people. So I see Sarah there on the side of, of my screen because she's now sharing her screen. So I see her. Um, you know, if I were to bump into Sarah, is the Exton Mall still open? <laughs> yeah, that's. I don't know. I mean, I don't live near that mall. It's like, you know, if I happen to be at the Exton Mall because I, I managed to get away from the bigger mall that's much closer to me, you know, and I end up over there and I bump into Sarah and I see Sarah, you know, if I were to pass her in the mall, I would probably say, hi, how are you? You know, and let's say I was walking with somebody and she was walking with somebody and we clearly were running, like hurrying, like we weren't going to have a lengthy conversation. I'd say, how are you? And what would Sarah say? almost guaranteed, she'd say fine. I don't know if that's your normal response, but it's probably some version of fine, right? And if she was being really nice, she'd say, how are you? And I would say fine. And we would leave that conversation knowing we are having a really crappy day and we just lied or not. But the point is this, it's a social pleasantry. We do it all the time. You see people, how many times at work or whatever, do you have a conversation with somebody? How are you? Fine, how are you? Fine, oh, great. And it may not be a great day. It may not be a fine day, but the point is I don't want to intrude. I don't want to then disclose like all that kind of stuff. If we don't want people to know the stuff that's going on in our life, the last thing we want them to do is share the stuff with us because we've asked and now we're in, you know, like we're intruding and nobody wants to do that. Asking somebody if they're okay is a completely different thing. I'm asking Sarah if she's okay because when I passed her at the mall, she looked really distressed about something and I'm asking if she's okay. I'm making this up, up, Sarah, obviously, but you know, I'm asking if she's okay, not because I want her to say I'm fine. Yeah, yeah, I'm perfectly fine. But because she looks like something's going on. I've noticed something about her. I think the answer is that she's not okay. That's actually why I'm asking the question. Now, the thing about it is this, Sarah is gonna say she's fine anyway, because she doesn't wanna dump that on me. You know, she doesn't want like, she's like yeah, yeah, I'm fine. And quite honestly, I'm going to be thinking, thank goodness she's fine. I thought she was having some problems, but she's fine. Whew, problem solved. 
The problem is this. I still am not sure she's really fine. She just says she's fine. So what I need to then say to her, and let's get back to the kids, right? If you're noticing things about kids, like they're isolating themselves from other people, they're um, more angry and frustrated than they were before, they're not engaging with you as a parent the way that they used to, and it doesn't seem like it's just a typical adolescent angst kind of bit. You know, like there's some things going on you know, they're fighting with their friends, you know, whatever it is that you're noticing. When you ask if they're okay and they say they're fine, you say, well, you know, there's some things that are going on that I'm concerned about. I've noticed this and this and this and this. And we share those things because not we're trying to out them like, oh, you have, you didn't hide it very well. I've been noticing, but rather I'm noticing because I care. I care enough about you that I've seen these things about you and I'm concerned. And that's why I'm asking. Are you sure everything's okay? And at that stage, maybe they say, well, I don't know. I guess, you know, maybe not. And then as a parent, we have to do the most difficult thing that parents could ever have to do when their kids are struggling. We shut up. <laughs> Remember that book you guys all got when your kids were born in the hospital and before you left with that very first child? Remember that huge book that you get that says, here's how to raise a child? Everybody got that book, right? You didn't get the book? All right, every, I, anyway, I'm kidding. But that's the book every new parent wants, right? This big book, How to Do Everything to Parent. If such a book existed, on page one, when it says your kid is struggling, your job is to do what? The answer is always what? Fix it. My job is to fix it. My kid comes home and says some kid's bullying him at school. My first thought is, who's the kid? Where they live? Let's go. To which my kids would probably say to me, dad, don't you dare. Don't, don't. I just wanted you to know what was going on. You don't need to do anything about it, right? But as a parent, you feel inclined. I have to fix this. Your kid's struggling. They're sad. They're depressed. Maybe they're having thoughts of suicide. You want to fix it immediately. Make it go away. The problem is as adults, what we do is we fix with our mouths. We don't fix with our ears very well. We fix with our mouths. And oftentimes what we do is we tell kids things that they already know. Maybe you should like go get a new group of friends. Have you tried reaching out to so-and-so? What if you reached out to these people? You could talk to them. Why don't you hang out with them a little bit more? We're not doing it because we're idiots. We're doing it because we're trying to be helpful. It's all well-intentioned. There's nothing wrong with trying to be helpful. The problem is that what our kids need in these moments is to have us be quiet so that they can tell us what it is that they need to tell us. When we're talking, they're not. That's a problem. So we stop talking and we listen. We don't judge them. We never tell them, hey, don't worry about it. Everything's going to be okay. Because that then goes back to the minimizing bit where then they start thinking you're, you're old. <laughs> you don't get it. We don't tell them everything's going to be okay because the truth is we don't know. We want it to be okay. If we could will it to be okay, we would will it to be okay, but we can't. So we listen. Then what we do to get our kids to realize we actually have been paying attention is that we reflect back to them what they just shared with us. So kids rarely say one sentence. You know, they have a whole like monologue. They'll start talking. And oftentimes what I might say is, you know, hold on one second. What you're saying is really important. I want to make sure that I'm understanding it the way that you want me to understand it. It sounds like you're saying A, B, C, and D, you know, something like that. Then I always say, do I have that right? Because kids are more than willing to say, no, <laughs> it's not D, it's more like E. So I say, okay, so it sounds like what you're saying is A, B, C, and E. Do I have that right? Yes. Okay, great. Continue. And then they keep talking. <laughs> but what has happened in that moment is that they realized you heard them the way that they wanted you to hear them. You have digested the information the way that they wanted you to get it. And that you're not making assumptions or judgments about whatever they've said. You're simply on with whatever it is that they are talking about. We then need to let kids that are suicidal know that they're not alone. This is not a data statement. This isn't, oh, I was at this talk and I heard that there's lots of kids who have thoughts of suicide. You're not alone from that context. That's not the not alone. My guess is your kids know those things. This is 
they may not have shared this with anyone before. You might be, if you're lucky, the first person they have come to to talk to about this. You may not experience what they're experiencing. You may not be able to fully appreciate what they're experiencing because you don't feel the same way, maybe never have felt that way. Your job is not to say, oh, I felt that way before. Let me tell you all about it. No, no, that's not your job either. Your job, though, is to let them know that by them sharing this with you, you're there with them. Doesn't mean that you're there and you're going to solve all their problems. It doesn't mean that you know exactly how they feel. It means that they are not alone in their struggles by themselves anymore. They are no longer silently trying to manage this on their own, that you will help them. Whatever it takes to figure out how to get them help, you will help them. They're not alone. Remember how we talked about hopelessness? You know, some, they're always trying to get better. They're trying to find some way to get better until eventually they feel like they can't anymore. When hopelessness kicks in, people also start to believe treatment isn't helpful. Nothing can, I've been trying to fix myself for years. <laughs> that doesn't work. Nobody can do this. It's not going to work. Or better yet, they've been to two or three therapists in the past, and they would say, that didn't help me out a whole lot. So the next person's not going to help me either. Eh. The argument that I like to make is this. Let's say you've been to see six other people already, and you feel like those six people were not helpful. There are two options. One option is give up, stop looking for somebody who can be helpful in, in that capacity, right? That's one option. Somehow miraculously figure out how to deal with this on your own. I mean, the internet's really helpful, but I don't know, we'll see. Or the other option is go see a seventh person. My question to you is this, what happens if the seventh person is the person that makes the difference? but you chose to give up. It happened that way and it happens that way quite a bit. I had a teenager in my office actually, this is two years ago, I guess, who came into my office, teenage boy, comes into my office, sits there, crosses his arms like this, not saying much of anything. And the first thing he eventually says to me is this, he goes, you're, how many was I? You're the fourth person I've seen in the last two months, I think is what it was, fourth in the last two months. You're the fourth person I've seen in the last two months. So it's easy, you know, I mean, I could easily sit there and respond to that. Yeah, that's interesting. Like, tell me about the other people you saw. Or I could say, you know, like, maybe this will be different. I mean, I could tell them any of that kind of stuff. We tell them any, I can totally defend this argument one way or the other. But I sat there for a second. I said to him, you know what? Maybe I suck too. And he was like, suddenly the arms came down. He got a little bit more animated. Okay. <laughs> and he started talking. He, his message to me, you're the fourth person in two months is nobody can help me. I don't want you to be disappointed when you can't help. Me. Nobody can. My mom dragged me here. She's making me come in. She's parading me around to all the people in the area because like somebody's going to be helpful. I just want you to know you're not going to be and, you know, don't be upset when when that's what happens here. And so I told him you might be right. And caught him off guard and it worked. Keeps coming in. What do you know? The last thing, of course, is this. As a parent. A, there's things that can be helpful. They're not alone, all this kind of stuff. Let's see if we can get you to somebody who can be helpful for you. How can we get you there? What can we do? And if you're not sure, you can talk to the school. I'm gonna just put you guys on the spot here, but you know, talk to the school. Where can we get support? Can you get support in school? Yeah, we get support in school. How do we do that, right? Is there, there's a way to get support outside of school? All right, we can do that kind of stuff too, right? There's lots of different places in which support can happen. And with telehealth these days, there's enormous ways that those things happen. I will tell you, I'm, I'm just gonna put this out there right now because people always ask at the end. Telehealth is wonderful. It's great. It, I, I, I have a patient in Pittsburgh right now. <laughs> I 
because they live in this area. They're going to college out there. Totally works. Would never have worked in the past, but it totally works now. But the behavioral health system is so backed up right now because of the demand that even when people see people via telehealth, it doesn't mean they've got an appointment next week or the week after. I'm hearing like six, eight, 10 months sometimes uh, in some places where you would never see wait lists that long. I'm not saying give up, don't keep looking. People can sneak you in, these things do happen. But the point is it, there's a lot out there. Your job though is we're going to work to get you help. And sometimes the school is a great alternative to kind of starting that process even when somebody outside of the school is not available yet. And I know there's a lot of discussion. Do we want the school involved in what's going on? I would say there's some value to that. <laughs> there is some value to it. All right, last thing before we get to some Q&A. Why don't we seek help? Lots of things. There's practical barriers, insurance, time, location. Some of these things, again, have been thrown out the window with COVID. Like, you can't make it to your appointment. You want to know why behavioral health is so backed up? because the no-show rate is almost zero these days. Where are you? You're at home, I'm at home, let's meet. How are we gonna do this? Right here on the computer. Everyone shows up. Like the no-show rate is almost non-existent. Used to be a different issue before. And insurance right now, most insurance companies are paying the same reimbursement rate for a telehealth visit as it would if you were in the office, which makes it more you know, positive, the providers want to do it via telehealth. You're getting the same reimbursement rate. Why would you not? But there are obviously these practical barriers certainly exist when we move into a world of everybody has to, you know, if the insurance companies kick back on the reimbursement rates and people say you have to come back into the office, there are practical barriers. History, history gets in the way sometimes. I took my kid to three people before they didn't help. Why would I take them to see a fourth person? Or when I was a kid or as an adult, I saw somebody, I didn't find it to be terribly helpful. I don't think my kid's gonna get anything out of it. History gets in the way. We have a problem sometimes, we listen to our kids. Um, the kid who's terribly depressed and says, listen, I'll figure it out, I'll get through it. And as a parent, we go, thank goodness, they're gonna figure it out and get through it. Like, thank, you know, like, phew, I'm, I'm prepared, I'm ready to help, but they said they can handle it. I'm gonna let them try to handle this. Sometimes we want to listen to our kids and give them the opportunity to do things for themselves. But when they are struggling, what we want to do is give them a voice in the decision that we're making together and then help guide them to it. We don't need to listen to everything they have to say. We also get into a pattern of it's just a phase, right? Oh, they'll get through this. It's not that big of it's COVID. This is what the problem is right now. It's COVID like it's, it's a phase. It will get better. And we're just gonna hope for the best. The problem is that we know that some people don't get through the phase, if it's that, right? They don't get through it. And hoping for the best doesn't always give us the results that we're looking for. And then there's some things that are about us. There's that pride thing. I work with a lot of um, child psychiatry fellows or trainees, like right before they go into independent practice, they, they come through our program and I meet with them. And I always ask them something at the beginning of their fellowship. I say, because some of them at that stage have already had kids of their own. Some of them haven't, may or may not be planning. It doesn't really matter. The point is, I say to them, what do you imagine it takes for the parent to pick up the phone and call you to help them with their kid? If you yourself, I mean, and then I sort of say, let's make it even more real, right? Here you are a child psychiatrist and you're having a problem with your kid. What's the barrier getting in the way of you calling somebody else for help? Can you imagine the sense of incompetence? I'm not a, like, like this is the, pro, not that it's real incompetence. Don't, I mean, don't hear it the wrong way. That's the belief. I'm supposed to be able to take care of my own kid. I have to be able to do this on my own. Calling somebody else means I'm a failure, right? There's that shame that goes along with this whole thing. If I got to call, some, that's terrible. What are other people going to think of me? Right? And then, of course, this fear of failing as a parent. If I have to ask somebody else for help, have I, have I failed? You know, it's that secret that our kids don't really appreciate 
and won't appreciate until one day maybe they become parents too, which is we all have this thought one day our kids leave the house and the anxiety comes from the, the, the question of this, did I do a good enough job? <laughs> did I do a good enough job? Like when my kid leaves the home, can they wash their own clothes? Can they make their own food? Can they clean their house? <laughs> like I've got three boys. I'm worried, you know, it's like you have to contribute to something here. <laughs> like we've got to make things. Work. But the point is when it comes to these kinds of issues, this fear of failing as a parent, it's like asking for help is a massive hurdle. And so I remind our child fellows this, that when parents show up with their kids, think about what it took for them to get here in the first place. And you have to meet them there. You can't meet them with my God, what is she doing? And why is she saying these things to this kid? No, 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 no. They've come to you. Look what it took to get there. Anyway, so just some last quick resources for anyone that wants to think about these warning signs. There's a website, youthsuicidewarningsigns.org. It has all the information I shared. It's not a, it's not a website designed for if you're feeling suicidal, this is what you need to know. It is a website for people who are talking with others that are having thoughts of suicide, like how can I be helpful in some way? So all of it is on there. Some great information on that website, um, youthsuicidewarningsigns.org. Pretty easy to remember if you think about it. There's two resources that I always share with everybody. One is the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline number, uh, which is 1-800-273-TALK. I'm not gonna get into the fact that that number is gonna change in a year and a half because I don't want people starting to dial the new number because if you start dialing the new number, it's going to be a problem now. It's just don't, <laughs> don't. Um, but uh, we've done a fantastic job in Pennsylvania over the last year and a half, improving our ability to answer those calls quickly um, and locally. In fact, uh, Chester County does have a, um, a call center now that's answering the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. So. You know, if you call that number within Chester County, somebody there is going to answer the call. If it's after their hours or whatever, that call is getting bumped into at this stage over to Bucks County and somebody there is answering it 24 seven. So it's getting answered, you know, fairly locally. But we also know that people sometimes don't like to talk to others. They like to use their thumbs down conversation. So it is, there is a crisis text line, which is 741741. You can text anything to start that conversation. I'd love it if you started with PA, not because anything other than we get access to some of the, the metadata. We don't get access to the actual texts that are going back and forth, but the state has a contract with the crisis text line, which helps them to understand where the texts are coming from. Like you get the zip or the area code and the first three numbers of the phone number that tells you sort of, you probably know in Downingtown, like, you know, how many exchanges are there in Downingtown? There's probably three or four at most, two or three, you know, so we know that those texts are coming from that area. It doesn't tell us you know, what they actually said to each other. Sometimes they get demographic information from people that they're able to share. So it tells us like what audience is using it and so on and so forth. So those are just really two good resources we wanna make sure everyone has access to. So if they're struggling, they have a way to get help. And again, as a parent, you're like, I did everything that was on the slide. I'm not sure what to do next. How do I help? You can call the lifeline yourself with your kid and have the conversation. You do. You can be a third party caller, as they say, make the call for somebody else, make the call because you're worried about somebody else. I don't know what to do. And they'll help you with that too. And then finally, this is my information in terms of how to get in touch with me. Um, I will leave that up just for a second. Actually, Chris, if you want to copy and paste that, you can throw that into the, the chat or something for people because then we can go back to sharing our screen and go through some Q&A. Okay. okay. Give you a second to pull that if you want to pull that. All wait, all of it or just your email? Just the all of it? Yeah, don't call my phone. Like I gotta be honest. Just I'm the just, email. Okay. <laughs> Two days out of the week, I'm in my office. The other three I'm not right now. Ah. Yeah. All right. So I'm gonna stop share, which puts us back here together. And happy to see what our questions were. And <laughs> yes. Okay. So we okay, so I wanted to ask because we forgot to. We're going to break down the fourth wall real quick. Um, I know we talked about a, a stop time of 845. We have about seven or eight questions. If I kind of stop them now, is do you, would you rather just answer them all? I can stay on longer if you want to stay. If I, people want to stay around, I'm happy to stay on longer. Okay. I just want to be worth thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, 
And also, yeah, a lot of people did ask if this would be recorded. I will put in the chat links to, um, we're gonna give this recording, the school district, um, Downingtown Area School District on their website under their parent page. There's It's a link on there that says parent speaker series. And you actually will be able to access this recording as well as all of the previous parent, or most of them, at least from this year. Um, there's one on uh, trauma and resiliency. There was one about substance use and how to have conversations starting at young ages um, from, this fall that just passed. So I'll put all those links up in the chat as well. So we do have a good amount of questions. Let's make sure we get to them. Um, okay, so the first one is, can these symptoms disappear on their own? So I think like the signs and symptoms, I guess, of depression or mm -hmm. and or suicide, because you covered both. How long do we wait to see if it's temporary? No, that's a good question. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's tricky because true, like a true major depressive disorder is something that has persisted for a while. Now it says two weeks, but like, let's be honest. Yes, by definition, it can be two weeks and that sort of hits the mark. Um, these things typically last much longer than that because people don't notice them as early as when they started and they continue for much longer. Um, can they go away on their own? In some contexts, I think the answer is yes. And I think it really comes down to the what we call the etiology of why the depression happened in the first place. There's a a lot of different quote unquote causes, if you will, to it. Sometimes it's a you know, biochemical kind of reaction. You can have a, a genetic predisposition. So you might have like lots of family members with a history of depression. Um, that tends to suggest that if it goes away, it might be popping back again at some point in time in the future. There's other times that people get depressed because of life circumstances and things that, like I said, all these people that are calling these days because of COVID, the depression, the anxiety, what I would argue is they probably are people who get depressed, not clinically depressed, but sad, overwhelmingly sad from time to time prior to all this stuff, but have the resources to manage it. And the anxiety is still people that probably got a little anxious from time to time, but now it's beyond what they can manage and handle at this point in time. So what I'd say is, could, they, could it get better? Possibly. It's always better to sit with somebody and talk about it first let's come up with a couple of strategies you can try. And if it's working, that's great. And if it's, you know, we don't want, the problem is we don't want to watch for too long. If you watch for too long, it can get bad real quick. And if it gets bad real quick, then we have a lot harder time getting out of it. Oh, you're on mute, Chrissy. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to type and do the questions and everything. I I'm pretty sure like the, 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 the top three words of 2020 were like, you're on mute. <laughs> Yeah, I have to agree, right? Um, so this one actually is more for Sarah because it's district specific. So can someone in DASD talk to kids and evaluate the kids? Should we ask kids to call any number even if there is no sign of depression? So it's kind of two separate ones in there. Okay, um, I think I can answer, at least assuming that I understand the question completely. Um, if we're talking about screening or assessing kids who perhaps have presented with thoughts of suicide um, or shared thoughts of suicide with a staff member. I will say in the past couple of years, we've done a lot of work, not only with our team of prevention specialists, but also with our school counselors and also our school psychologists to ensure that we do have a process and a protocol in place. So what I would say is if a child does present um, or shares those types of thoughts with a staff member, they, I would say they will be directed to a counselor or administrator and then depending upon the circumstances um, and staff availability, can maybe a school counselor who's screening that student and if additional assessment is warranted then they may reach out to a prevention specialist and sort of assess that student together. There may be instances depending upon the building we're discussing where the prevention specialist does both the screening and assessments. There are occasions where our school psychologists are also doing screenings and assessments. Um, it really does just depend upon the circumstances, obviously. But we do have staff who obviously are, are trained. And in those instances, I would say, obviously, parents will be notified regardless of sort of the outcome, just because of the highly sensitive nature. So if we have a child who we're screening or having a conversation about suicide with, we're obviously going to be notifying those parents and then following up with whatever community resources might make the most sense. Do you think that answered the question, Chrissy? <laughs> You're on mute. <laughs> this will be the theme of our Q&A. You're on mute, unmute, okay. I think so, thanks, Sarah. Yeah. Okay, so back to Dr. Winterstein. So in terms of dealing with social isolation, 
isn't it more of an adjustment disorder rather than biochemical depression? If we're talking about right now? I don't know. That's all they wrote in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, there is, there is what's called an adjustment disorder. An adjustment disorder is, you know, sort of a, something that has happened in a period of time as a response to something external that's going on. And so in this particular case, you know, there's a lot of adjustment disorders getting diagnosed in the midst of COVID, absolutely. Um, what I will tell you is that isolation and things of that nature and what comes across as an adjustment disorder in a history of somebody who has either experienced depression in the past or has a strong family history for it um, or other mood disorders, yes, it might be an adjustment disorder for a little while, but it could very easily transition into something more like a major depressive disorder as well. So it may start as an adjustment disorder just because of the context and the circumstances around it, but it, that may not be what ultimately is going on. We don't necessarily treat it any differently, to be honest with you. If they're depressed, they're depressed. Um, another question is, how do we help kids support peers without making them feel ultimately responsible? I guess yeah, this, this is a great question and, and really, you know, I think the, the key to all of it is creating a safe context for kids to feel comfortable sharing those conversations, working together as more like a warm handoff to some trusted adult. And I know that we always say that and everyone's like, oh, they're never going to talk to adults. There is a level of um, responsibility that we simply can't put on these kids. We do not want kids to feel like their responsibility is to take care of their friends. Um, it's one thing to go to a friend, like I'm having a bad day and having like, that's an okay conversation. Like I get that. Um, one of the conversations that I will never allow, you know, patients of mine work on safety plans, for example, I never, I explicitly tell them, you know, if you are in the midst of getting ready to make a suicide attempt, you do not have the right to call one of your friends right then and there. And the reason for that is that relationship will change forever, regardless of what ultimately happens in the next, you know, handful of minutes. Um, and that's not fair to you. It's not fair to them. And we don't want to put each other in those kinds of situations. But the challenge with all this, of course, is that, you know, kids are going through uh, you know, interpersonal development is like the big marker of what's going on in, in middle school and high school. Anyway, these kids are learning how to be friends with each other. And so it's all about, yeah, I can tell you something. I won't tell anybody and so on and so forth. Um, I will tell you, I don't anymore, but on my caseload in the past was a teenager whose friend told him that he was suicidal they talked about it, he felt better, they continued to have these conversations over a period of time. He promised he wouldn't tell anybody because again, he wanted to be a good friend. His friend died. And he may have been one of the only people that knew how much distress this other kid was in. And I will tell you, there is no evidence-based treatment for the amount of guilt that this kid will experience probably for the rest of their life. And there's just sort of, the, there's what they call radical acceptance. <laughs> you just have to accept the fact that this is where things are right now and we cannot change it. And it's incredibly difficult. You do not want to be the kid that's in that situation. And the only way to prevent that is to encourage them to find adults they can talk to. If they can't talk to mom or dad, okay, who else can we talk to? Who's another adult we can speak to about this? Is there somebody at school, somebody at their church, somebody on a sports team, like whatever, who is it that we can talk to? You want to pull in adults, like you don't want these kids dealing with these things on their own. It gets to be too much. Next. <laughs> there's things everywhere, All there's a lot of people. So um, is there anything being done? And I think you touched upon this a little bit with the wait times and telehealth and things, but is there anything being done to enable doctors psychologists and psychiatrists to be available in a more timely manner that is not cost prohibitive, in quotes, insurance. Um, if someone has the ability to turn a 24 hour day into a 30 hour day, then it's possible. But what I will tell you is there are plenty of behavioral health, like right now it's 845, right? We're, we're having this conversation. 
there are plenty of therapists out there that are seeing patients right now and they never, ever would have seen them at this time of night in the past because they're either, they're doing it because they know they, that people need them. But the point, I, like, I wish the answer was yes to that question. Mm -hmm. the, the other thing I can tell you though, just, just the telehealth bit, who you can see has to do with where you're licensed, right? So if I have a patient in New Jersey, for example, I have to have a New Jersey, like right now, I have a New Jersey license. Historically, I didn't because they would come across the river into Philly and see me there. It wasn't a big deal. I was licensed in Pennsylvania. They happened to be in Pennsylvania at that time. When COVID hit, you know, had to go get a temporary license in New Jersey because the couple of patients that I have from New Jersey, I could not see them via telehealth if they lived there. My point with this is you can see providers in Pittsburgh right now. You can see providers in Erie right now. You could see providers in Scranton right now because their license will cover them to see you as long as you're within the same state where they have a license to practice. So it's easy to think our scope of our, our range of providers is basically those people like traditionally it's, you know, for Downingtown, it's like you're looking at people that are kind of out in your area, even getting into Philadelphia as a drive. That's a hike from Downingtown. So you're looking at like a lot closer to you. You've got a much wider range to be looking at right now, which, you know, some providers don't want to see people that are much further away because they want to be able to know what are some local resources if I need to access those kinds of things. But the point is the accessibility from a licensure perspective is still there. So it's possible you could see somebody in Lancaster right now. There's actually a lot of, a lot of groups out in Lancaster. So, and there are national groups right now that are actually doing telehealth you know, somebody got really smart and they got like there's a couple of um, avenues to get a license where you can see people across you know 15 20 different states and so you have these massive telehealth like therapy groups that are going on in the country where you could get therapy from somebody who's in Arizona right now who happens to have a Pennsylvania license right yeah you know there are huge practices that emerged in the last several months to kind of address this okay um okay just a couple more Quick, maybe not quick uh, questions. Um, so someone gave a situation and said they were talking to a friend who's struggling that has, as a parent, they're both parents, um, and they're struggling with their daughter who is a um, young teenager and she has become depressed and started using substances during the pandemic. Um, and so the parent is struggling on how to address this and parent that child without kind of pushing too hard or like just putting too much pressure on. So like, what would be your best advice for a parent to do like to address it, but not feel like you're pushing like that balance, I guess. Yeah. I think that, I think the challenge with this really comes to how do you have a conversation with kid that doesn't sound like you're in trouble. Stop doing all this stuff. It's not okay. I don't like this. Like the, the hardest part is you, you have to kind of resist the instinct to um, respond in a way that you want to, which is bad, 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 stop doing it. Quit smoking the pot. Like you got to stop. <laughs> like, like that approach turns kids off immediately. So the real challenge is basically saying, listen, I know that you're going through some stuff. I don't know what that stuff is. I love you. I want to be here for you. I'm available for you to talk to about these kinds of things. You know, can you help me understand what's going on with you right now that has gotten you to this spot? I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to tell you what you have to do. I just want to hear and start with that. Like, see if we can open the door first. You know, if it turns into it's a much bigger problem, you know, the kid's actually suicidal or the kid's getting into substances that I don't want to say there's some substances we don't need to pay as much attention to and there's others we really do but the point is there are some gateway substances and then there are some other ones that are we're heading down a dangerous really dangerous path right now you know so opening up the door and hearing that you know and if you get to the point where you're starting to hear things you're not quite sure what to do about it like i'd say at this point it's let's listen and then it's how can i get some resources to help me with those other things that are going on okay all right, our last question. So we're actually, we're pretty good for time for the most part still. So. Um, so how much does it matter to, for, to the individual if they feel they are depressed, but don't necessarily meet all of those criteria points? Yeah. So maybe consider just sad, very sad, 
Um, does their personal perception drive their behavior and suicide risk? Yes. A lot and yes. If somebody believes they're depressed, that's like, look, I'm giving you the clinical definition of what major depressive disorder is, okay? I have to tell you as a psychologist, I hate diagnoses. I hate them. And it's not that I'm stuck in a world where I have to use them because if I don't diagnose somebody, guess what? Your insurance company isn't paying me. <laughs> then you're paying me out of pocket and nobody wants to do that. So yes, it's the necessary evil, but I could care less what your diet, what I want to know is what's your experience, right? So if your experience is, I can't handle this and this is too much and I like, I'm depressed and I can sit there and go, but you're sleeping just fine and you're eating just fine and you, you can seem to concentrate. Like I can sit there and go, you only get four out of five. It doesn't work. Like that doesn't matter. I really don't care. Um, if you're struggling, I want to understand your experience so that we can figure out how you can get past this experience. So I would say, you know, does it matter if they, what was the beginning of the question? Does it, how much does it matter if they themselves- How the individual, their own- Matters a whole lot. Their self. Yeah, it matters a whole lot. You know, like if they feel like they're struggling, let's talk about it, right? Um, what was the second part of it? There was the second- was, Does their personal perception drive their behavior or suicide risk? Would they just, if they don't meet criteria, are they just considered sad? Like if they don't meet anything, then what happens, I guess, right. what do you do? Saying that somebody's depressed, that's in the common verbiage these days. Like every, like what does being depressed mean? Yeah. You know, I gave you a clinical definition of it. Like somebody could say they're depressed. They might not meet criteria for, I'm not going to sit there and say you're not depressed. Yeah. You know, in, in the, in the world of, do I want to go there? In the world of insurance and stuff like that, I might need to figure out how to make you a little bit more depressed. Like just, <laughs> just this, right. you know, otherwise like, Really, you know, we're talking about these massive yeah. lists and stuff like that. If you don't meet criteria for a diagnosis, then like you can't get services. You need to like, not that you need, I don't want people to say, hear that and be like, ooh, we need to find some more symptoms. No, no, no. Yeah. But the point is, you know, yes, it matters what they think and their perception is critically important. I mean, the, the, this whole idea that perception can lead to suicidal behavior. I don't, I don't, did I tell the story about the, the military person, Sarah, last year? I did. Here, you, need you shared it last year. You didn't share it this year. That story always haunts me, but it's a great story. So I'll give you the, because it's a perception story. And so this is, this is the story. So I was fortunate enough many years ago to do some stuff with the military. And I was on one of our bases um, meeting with the medical staff there. And my job was really to help them to identify people in the special operations command. So these are like, you know, all those video games where you have, you know, call of duty and stuff like that. Like there are real people that have these insanely intense jobs that get, you know, pagers and messages that go off and they have to be at a certain place in two hours because they're jumping on a flight to go do some mission that they can't tell anybody about. Like, this is what we're talking about here. So I was there to basically work with the medical staff team because every time that group comes back from a deployment, they don't get deployed for 18 months. They get deployed for a couple of days, a week, a couple of weeks, and then they come back and they can't tell their spouses what they did. Like, it's super, super confidential. There's no, no discussion. It's all classified. Um, and so the med staff team, when they come back, has to meet with them to certify them to be redeployable, right? And they all want to be redeployable because if you're not redeployable, it messes because they're in teams. Everyone in the team has a role. If somebody on that team is not available, they either have to bring somebody over from another team to, to fill that role. It gets complicated. The point is they want to be recertified every single time they come back. So when I was there, I was having a conversation with somebody and they said, There's, I need to tell you something like this. This is critically important of something that happened here. So here you had somebody on one of these super high adrenaline, high risk teams who got the call, needed to get deployed. They have a go bag ready all the time, sitting there waiting in the closet, waiting to grab and go. They're on their way. Got the call. They were going to go do something. Told his wife, I got to go. 
she'd been th these these special ops teams they leave all the time so like sh this is not new to her but it's still anxiety provoking because you do not know if you're ever going to like they're doing they're going out and killing osama bin laden this is not like low risk stuff this is super high risk stuff and so he says i gotta go he leaves um his wife of course is worried as she always is she calls her brother who lives just off the base and asks if he can come over because you know just can we hang out like that kind of more like a comfort kind of thing so the brother has a, has a pass to get on the base he comes over parks his brand new truck in the parking lot or not parking lot in the driveway and of course this guy you know he's if anyone's been on a military base you know the layout it's a bunch of houses that are all cookie cutter they're exactly the same on this street they're like perfect distance from each other. The next street is the next ranking one. The house is a little bit bigger, but the same idea. And so he's buddies with the neighbors. And so like, you know, his buddy next door, his neighbor friend next door, you know, happens to glance over in the middle of the day and sees this brand new silver pickup truck in, he, and he knows that he's left. And he sees this brand new silver pickup truck in the driveway next door and he doesn't recognize it because this, you know, the brother-in-law just got this new truck and he never told anybody he got the new truck. He just happened to come over with it, or at least the neighbor didn't know about the new truck, right? And so he's like, all right, no big deal, whatever. Because a pickup truck is a normalcy on a military base. It's either a muscle car, a pickup truck, or a motorcycle. If you don't have one of those, you don't belong there. So this is like not a big deal. So he sees this a couple hours later, the pickup truck's still there. All right, a few hours later, it's like eight o'clock at night, pickup truck's still there, interesting. 10 o'clock at night, pickup truck's still there. I forget what time it was eventually that this happened, but it was like, you know, 12 o'clock, one o'clock in the morning or at night or something like that, the pickup truck's still there. Well, the brother-in-law was just staying over, you know, no big deal, brother-in-law staying over. So the guy is like, oh, I get what's going on. And so what does he do? He reaches out to the guy who is somewhere in the world doing some mission and says, why is there a brand new silver pickup truck in your driveway? Long story short, that person didn't come home alive. They came home, they didn't come home alive because the perception of what was going on in that house was incredibly different than what actually was going on in the house. The problem with it, of course, is had he known it was his brother-in-law's pickup truck and that his wife had called him to come over to comfort her while he was gone, he would have completely been for it, appreciated it, loved it, thanked him, all that other kind of stuff. But because he didn't know about the pickup truck, and we don't know, but my guess is there's probably a backstory to all of this that would have him somewhat concerned about this. He had no idea what was going on, made an assumption about it. The perception of infidelity is going on. He ends his own life. And that's how the story ends. So yeah, this is the sad way we're gonna end our discussion tonight. But the point is, you get it though, perception is terrible. You know, kids who perceive that, like they, you know, you get these kids, super high achieving kids that, my kid went through it actually like last night their grades were getting reported and junk like that you know and he's sitting there like sweating bullets because he wasn't sure if his teachers had graded all of his assignments for the the semester yet and it looked like his grade was going to be lower than he had thought it was going to be and he's like literally in his room like almost in tears waiting for this to come through of course he was able to sit there and go okay let's let's wait let's wait till the whole thing's done see what happens and then of course it was better but the point is the perception that something is not going well can drive people like he was sad about something that he didn't need to be sad about it's because he was looking at it at the wrong time you know so like these are the kind of things that happen it's important okay all right i do have one last question that i said Get in and then and then we will for real be done um because i know it's i already know that's a short answer so if you're noticing your middle school teen because someone stayed on late enough to ask this so i feel like i'm obligated i have to ask so <laughs> you're staying with us so long so if you've noticed your middle school teen shows a few signs um i.e withdrawal would you recommend we contact their guidance counselor so if they're showing a couple signs yeah i, I would start with let's talk to the kid Hey, I've noticed that you're you're not participating in this anymore. Or you seem to be, like you're not talking to your friends anymore. Or whatever's going on, like those, you're like you know, what's going on? 
Like I would start that conversation. If it doesn't seem to be getting anywhere and it seems that the withdrawal might have something related to do, particularly if it has something to do with school or something like that, it doesn't hurt to talk to the guidance counselor about it. I'm sure, you know, they'd be happy to like, let's, maybe I can have, to have a conversation with them, figure out what's going on. Maybe they'd be willing to talk to me. I think, you know, that's not a bad way to go. I always say, let's start the conversation at home first for two reasons. One is we want to promote that we can have these conversations with our kids. We want them to come to us when they are struggling. So if we immediately push them off to the guidance counselor, it gives the impression that I can't handle this. Let's, let's send them over to Ms. Brooks because she can do it, but I can't. And the other side of it is we need to somewhat be the triage system for the school too, because if it isn't as big of a deal as we were worried that it was a big deal or you know, whatever, then we don't need to throw it upon the school for them to then get involved because as much as, well, they've got a ton of stuff going on, let's just say that. And so the last thing we wanna do is give them more to do when it really may not be something they need to get involved in. But the key thing is we wanna have these conversations at home. We want our kids to know that we can have these discussions. So therefore, Start it there. Okay, there's one more question, but I only because no, no, no. I, I guess it's like people are like, wait, we can still ask questions if we're still here. And it's one of those things like if you can't stay, you can't say all of it will be yeah. like, just because of the context of it. Can a teen who is seeing a therapist decided they didn't like her anymore and won't see anyone now. Teen says she's got this and is going to live her best life. What do we do? Yes, she has told therapist thoughts of suicide. Um, if the person is still, and then that's it. I have to close questions Then we're yeah. done. I'm so well, sorry. You have his email in the chat. Please check the chat for um, Dr. Winterstein's email directly. So I think there's a couple of things there. I mean, if this is somebody who like therapy is not helping me, I'm not going to see this person and nobody's going to help me. Boom. That's one way it's maybe therapy has been helpful and I'm feeling better right now. And we've like, if the question is, did the kid and the therapist agree that we're kind of done right now? If that's one case, then okay, fine. If, however, it's this is didn't like her anymore and won't see yeah. anyone now. Yeah. So I, I think the way to handle that is again, it's a tricky kind of thing, which is okay, you didn't like her. I get that. All right. Look, I I know that I'm not the perfect person for everybody either. It's like I refer people out to others all the time, not because, you know, it's just like, listen, go see that person. They're better for you right now. Um, you know, if if there isn't something that's clicking there, I think it's important to kind of recognize, well, listen, I understand that you want to take care of these things. I understand that these are, it's important for you to feel some sense of ownership over how you're doing and, and you getting better. Um, but it's important to me as a parent to know that you're doing okay. And I get it, you know, Dr. So-and-so or Ms. So-and-so or whatever, like that person wasn't, maybe wasn't the right person for you. What I'd like to do though, is see if we can find somebody else. And if that person agrees that you're doing fine, then okay, then we can kind of, we'll, we'll watch that way. But it's important though, that I know that you're doing okay. And it's important, I think that given some of the experiences that we've had recently, particularly if she's talking about suicide and stuff like that, those things can pop up at a moment's notice. And I'd like to make sure that there's somebody who's with us that can help us and support us because yeah. as much as I'm going to listen to you, as much as I want to hear what you have to say, I want to be helpful. Sometimes I need somebody to be on our team. And a professional, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. We're calling it now, but, but so much information. I just, you know, we want to make sure that we give an opportunity for folks that they take the time to, tune, you know, to yep. tune in and participate that we're able to help. So, um, Thank you so much, Dr. Winterstein, for being with us and sharing all of your knowledge again with us. Um, again, and you, everyone that's been here tonight, you'll get a follow-up email tomorrow uh, that will have links to the recording if you would like to go back and check out the recording, as well as other resources that are available through um, Down in Tenerife School District and CTC. And with that, happy Monday, happy new year. <laughs> um, be safe, stay well, and thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Bethann. Thank you.